Good morning and a warm welcome to this session, Why What Happens Off Screen Matters. We've got two brilliant speakers lined up for this morning and I'm going to introduce them to you just as soon as I've shown you the most powerful film framing the debate this morning. But very quickly, I'd just like to introduce myself. Um, I have worked in the screen industries for most of my career. I'm extremely proud now to be a co-director of Excel Stories and Sign. Both programs are led by the University of York and Sign, I should say, stands for the Screen Industries Growth Network. Excel Stories is a, a program that invests in R&D, invests in interactive immersive content, supports new storytelling, new stories, new voices. And Sign, as the label says on the tin, supports the industry in terms of growth. That is in terms of business support and skills and training, research, with a particular focus on diversity related programs. But actually everything we do is about embedding the principles of equality, diversity and inclusion in our work. And we're determined that when we do all we can to grow the screen industries in Yorks and Homicide, we do that with every intention to reduce the barriers, to open up the industry, so that people who are passionate about film, TV and games development can work in this industry and can be part of an extraordinary creative force that's in Yorks and Humberside. And they can do so because they have the skills, the passion um, and the determination and not just because they're part of a select few who have the contacts and the networks. This is so important. Research report after research report has been issued over the years showing how the workforce in film and TV, particularly in those two sectors, is underrepresented in terms of gender, race, disability, and the Social Mobility Commission actually launched a new research report not so long ago showing how class was a key determinant in your success or otherwise in working in the industry. And of course there's intersectionality across all of those areas. So we, like many others, are trying to address these issues. Uh, and the big question is, why do those issues still remain as barriers? What are the barriers? How can we remove those barriers? And why does this matter? Why does it matter to everyone? So this short session will kick up that debate. As I said, uh, I'll introduce two uh, fantastically qualified speakers on this issue. But before I do that, this film, Industry Voices, which was commissioned by Sign uh, last year and released uh, this year, will help frame the debate and give you an insight into what the issues are in terms of working in the industry. And then our discussion will broaden out uh, the, the, the topic to look at why it's important and what we can do about it. Cue the film, Industry Voices. Just know when you do us wrong, you might trend. That's it. Um, I've just had someone feed back on you and say you're, you're very northern. What does that mean? I was slightly in front of my colleague and he said, Oi Rosa, get to the back of the bus. I don't wake up every day thinking about being working class. Do you think posh people wake up thinking every day about being posh? I suddenly felt very aware of my race. Felt like I was walking around with a label on my head. Being a mother and being in this industry, you could just laugh, to be honest, because it's like, what's the point? There are glass ceilings that are piled upon glass ceilings, especially if you're not white straight male. I'm not pretending to be somebody else anymore just to fit in. I could draw a very straight line between having spoken up about things and then no longer having a job. Yes, you can look fine on the outside and yes, you can look normal, but actually behind the scenes and personally and privately and domestically, you can be struggling. People would make fun and be nasty about them. In fact, one person said my food smelled like dog food. There aren't many people like me. There's not many people like me. 
There are not that many people like me. There's not many people like me. There aren't many people like me. There's not enough people like me. I don't know anybody like me. There aren't many people like me. There are not very many people like me. No, there's not many, not many people like me. I don't think there's a lot of people like me. If you can find another five, I'll give you a tenner. I was born in Jamaica. In my lifetime, in my life, I've walked down the road to collect water. I lived that. When I first came to the UK, I lived in Ipswich in my primary school. Other students fell to my skin to see what it felt like. They had never been around a black person before. I'm Leeds, born and bred. I went to a really ordinary, comprehensive school. I was the first woman in my family to go to university. I'm from Cardiff. I'm from a little place called Butte Town, otherwise known as Tiger Bay. I'm mixed race, so my dad is from Jamaica and my mum is Chinese, Bayesian and white. And so I'm ticking all the boxes here. Uh, I grew up in a Catholic family with six sisters. I'm the only boy and a very working class, I suppose. My dad was a factory worker. We grew up in a council estate. Huge amount of racism in those early days. I think we were quite sort of typical of immigrant family really. I've always lived in the same area which is in Chapel Town in Leeds. To me it was a beautiful place but to other people Chapel Town can be seen as gangs, drugs, the ghetto, police. I was born in Birmingham. I was absolutely adamant in becoming a writer so I focused all my energy into doing that. I'm a proud Bradfordian, um, you know I'm from Yorkshire, I love being from the north. I was born here but we grew up in Kenya, came back here, I went to school in Bristol. We grew up in Leeds, it was really nice, I grew up with all my grandparents, my aunties and uncles. We were working class but I don't think I ever realised we were. I was growing up in what most people might describe as the most stereotypical media upbringing. I was white, I was male, I grew up in Surrey, I was from the south, I spoke proper. A lot of people are stunned when I say, oh yeah, I'm autistic and I'm gay. I absolutely adore the fact that it's so creative. I've always felt really, really lucky to work in the television industry. I've met some of the nicest, most creative, brilliant people. I like that the industry offers people the opportunity to express themselves. It allows you a platform to tell stories that are really important that you might not be able to tell otherwise. You can go from idea to, to broadcast and something that you've made will be shown to millions of people. Oh, how long have you got? It's very difficult to not look away when you ask that question. Um, <laughs> um. Oh. Um. You would constantly want to be funded, you'd constantly want to be respected, you'd constantly want to be working, and all of those three things you're usually not, or it feels like that really. We're still rife with people getting jobs on a nod and a wink. And I think that has such a stifling effect on diversity and equality. I do feel like the industry expects a specific type of person that I'm not. What makes me angry is that we're having to have these conversations. Why is representation such an issue for people to understand? My biggest issue with the TV industry is that it's not inclusive. We're the media. We are meant to represent the country. And as far as I'm concerned, the people making TV really don't match the people who are watching it. Did you say that if you're black, you have to be, you know, twice as good? I've always had to work so much harder and always had to be excellent, nothing less than. I don't want anything extra for me, but I feel like I have to work twice as hard. You end up having to make sure that you don't make mistakes. You need to work harder, you need to be better than everybody else in there. Straight away you are seen as this, you're just not white. You have to work 10 times harder. I don't want to pass down advice to another generation to tell them that they have to work twice as hard to get half as far. When you're from a working class background and you're starting out in TV, it's quite unforgiving. I thought people could see my poverty. Having kind of navigated myself for 30 years with the industry, I've got used to the fact that there aren't many 
working class people in the industry. It's not always been easy, being very working class, but trying to fit into a very middle class world. Sometimes I feel really inadequate when I'm in situations because although I'm, I'm an intelligent woman, my life experience is different from others. The things that I enjoy are different from others. So if we're having a group conversation and they're talking about really highbrow things that I didn't access as a child or like networks I didn't access. I find that quite intimidating. I think I felt a lot of shame about who I was, being working class, coming from a f family where, you know, my parents didn't speak English. I think I did pretend to be someone I wasn't for a long time. You know, you could throw a stone at Broadcasting House and you'd have a hard time meeting somebody working class who, you know, wasn't behind a desk. I do get notes back wonderfully authentic and you still live in the north, how marvellous. It's a competition really for space, for storytelling and uh, I'm not sure that the working class are winning really. Everybody said the same thing which is you will not get work in Yorkshire because I, I don't think people consider regional work to be real work. Just being back in Hull now you feel it, the poverty of ambition because of where you are. You never really believe you can get out of that factory. You never really believe you can get out of that city. It's not always easy being regional and northern and having a very northern accent. I definitely feel like I have received a regional battle and thought to myself, maybe if I just learned a London accent, I feel like I'd be way further along in my career right now if I had a London accent. It's definitely difficult to get your foot in the door. It's more if you know someone who can get you in, especially in this region. I've said before that we're at least 20 years behind. If we don't start working urgently, then it's just going to get worse. I think mental health has been something that I've struggled with when I'm out of work and when I'm chasing my next contract. That's always been really hard in the sense that if I didn't have that focus, if I didn't have that routine, I'd develop OCD. It's something I never spoke about. Like I've never spoke to my colleagues about it. My boss knows because she's always backed me. I just saw it as yet another weakness that was better to hide. Right now, I am technically a freelancer. It does weigh heavily on you mentally. It's very isolating. You can feel very alone. It's a pick me situation. It's a please pick me situation in the media industry and that can be very, very taxing. And of course it affects your mental health and makes you worry. Not to feel like you can speak to someone about what's really going on, you know, what you're going through personally is really difficult, but that's what the system is like. It doesn't allow you to be vulnerable. The biggest challenge for me in my industry, if I'm going to be totally honest, has been being a working mum. That has been by far the biggest challenge. Family means everything to me, like I'm a single mum of four. I can't build our wealth. I can't do the things other people do, like we can't go on holiday, you know, we can't go shopping, just basic things like that. Being a mother and being in this industry, you could just laugh, to be honest, because it's like, what's the point? And I know that might sound really negative, but a lot of jobs are full time. Once you start to have a family, and then you try to um, do that kind of job while juggling childcare and all of that kind of stuff. It's difficult and it is a pressure. I don't want to be strong. I don't want to be a strong single black mother. I don't want to do that. I want to be very weak and cry. <laughs> I worry about being stereotyped all the time. It's always there. I've grown up with it. You know, my personal experience being that like, oh, this is a black game, so let's get the black guy to talk about it. Then you're now forced into a catch-22 situation. You may necessarily want to be truthful about the game because it's harmful and it's got stereotypes in it, but you also know in being truthful about the game that you may be ostracized, you may be pushed aside, and you may be put in a situation where it's going to damage your entire career. I just want to be able to say that a spade is a spade, that the sky is blue if that is indeed the case, as opposed to having to be like, well, will I be seen as an angry black woman? Will I be seen as too sensitive? Do I have to work harder because they might think that because I'm a parent, I'm playing that single parent card? If you don't extra smile as a black person, somebody might think that you're aggressive. It's the being super duper overly nice just to be seen as regularly nice so that everybody can walk away and say, oh, he was actually nice. Is that why is there an actually there? I feel like when you work on something and they say, oh, you can't wear your hair like that, it'll attract attention. That's when people are trying to deny your 
culture a little bit. Like, I get it in some instances. Um, actually, I don't. I don't understand why I would have to be told not to wear my hair as an Afro for a job. That's a bit weird, isn't it? I remember once I had my hair in single braids, which is what a lot of black women do with their hair. Straight away, it was like a massive thing within the office and everyone's trying to touch it and pull it and how do you do it and stuff like that. Some of the comments I used to get were just awful. Being likened to Medusa, you know, people touching my hair. It wasn't pleasant. I've been doing some work for an American production company. The American producer came up to me and said, um, I've just had someone feed back on you and say you're very northern. What does that mean? And I realised that it, for him, northern was just geographical. Well, I live in the north, but actually what I realised what that other producer meant was probably that I was working class. I think as I moved up and I, you know, wanted to direct, I felt like being a woman was, uh, you know, a barrier. I could see all the boys around me directing and sort of being told, oh, but we see you more as a producer. This industry is crying out for female directors. Same old phrase about women just being brilliant producers and organisers and therefore you're not encouraged as much with the technical side. I want to be a director. Everyone's telling me you have to be a producer. You have a vagina. I um, I've never made one, but I have received them. So in my voluntary position as chair of the Writers Guild, I think I was pretty blinkered about the realities of what was going on in the industry. But since I've been involved with the Guild, I've heard some truly appalling stories. I have never made a formal complaint because I'm too afraid to do anything of the sort. I did once try and make a formal complaint and I was basically told that I was a liar. So... That's as far as it went. I wouldn't say I've ever made a formal complaint, but I've made my position clear. I made a uh, formal complaint and it was costly. It did essentially cost me my job, but you don't overtly lose it. Slowly work gets taken away. You're no longer CC'd into emails or invited to meetings and then suddenly your job performance isn't very good and in spite of the fact you're like, well, I can't know something you didn't tell me. I could draw a very straight line between having spoken up about things and then um, no longer having a job. Any complaint within the industry, I've never seen it work ever, and I've heard of many over the years when people complain about this, this and that. 18,000 people complained through emails and, and, and the right way, and that didn't do nothing. But as soon as something's a trending topic on Twitter, now it's like, yo, we need to do something about this. The very first time I experienced racism in TV, I was working as a runner in a studio, and um, we had these trolleys where we would deliver tea and toast to the edits. I was slightly in front of my colleague and he said, Oi, Rosa, get to the back of the bus. And I was so shocked, I didn't say anything. And another colleague, this little blonde, beautiful white girl said, that's racist, you shouldn't say that. And he was like, oh, it's only a joke. I told them that this person was racist and he got promoted. So it teaches me that you just don't say anything. That was the first and last time I reported anything to do with race. Valued by who? I've at times felt very valued and very secure and very supported. Sometimes I feel like my voice is valued, I really do. And it's those times that you live for. I do feel like my, my word is valued when it's listened to, but I think getting people to listen is often very hard. At times I felt disillusioned and unhappy. But most of the time I don't, you know, most of the time what gives me the strength to carry on is the people I'm filming. I don't really feel like my um, voice is valued in this industry, I have to be honest. I wouldn't say I feel valued by the mainstream media. I don't believe my voice would necessarily be heard. Your voice isn't necessarily accepted. I don't feel valued. No, I've never felt valued by the industry. The importance of somebody's voice now is how many people are going to listen to it or watch it. And I think that's the question that television unfortunately asks before it decides whose voice is going to be heard. I think the most important thing about the whole Black Lives Matter and everybody discussing it, it was important that they did that because I don't know how anybody else feels, but I felt a real relief that other people were saying it and that I wasn't 
going mad. It wasn't just me. With the current climate, you'd think that things have changed. Um, they haven't. They've just changed on the surface for everyone who's looking in. We're doing this for diversity, we're doing that. I'm not seeing it. It took a man's death, but the message, the voice and the importance of what's going on with us got massively amplified. And I don't think this is the time to be quiet and let the window of opportunity be missed. Unfortunately, it's taken us too long to get there of men, of white people, of people of privilege to understand what constitutes harassment, a discriminatory act, a microaggression, to understand how that makes a workplace unbearable for people and makes a career unpursuable for someone. We are coming to a better understanding. We've still a hell of a long way to go. The industry's never held accountable for the prejudice and racism that it often gives out. Diversity schemes are often window dressing, essentially. To be like, look, look how many brown and black people we've got around. Young ones, we're helping. Um, but they never progress. I wish diversity schemes didn't exist. I know that makes me a hypocrite because I run one and I'm always championing them to people. But if we had an industry that was already diverse and already thought about the people that they wanted to be in it, then we wouldn't need them. I started my career 10 years ago and I've seen one black person who's a commissioner. That's a decade and one person to look up to. I'm the token piece to make you feel like representation is happening, but behind the camera, it's very much not. And I'm just one person, but because I might have a big voice, it might make you feel like it's happening greatly, but it's not. The trick just works wonderfully. And it's definitely something I feel like needs to change. We've got to the stage where we've admitted there's a problem. I think it has to be understanding that room has to be made, that expecting there to be this weird trickle up effect where if we get a few runners who are black or working class or have a disability, they will at some point be director general of the BBC. That's going to take generations. I did um, the assistant commissioner's scheme. It was brilliant and like such an amazing experience. But it took a long time for me to convince myself to do it because I thought, well, I'm an exec. I should just be given a commissioning job if they want me. Why should I have to do a scheme? Like none of my white colleagues have to do a scheme. I'm really experienced. I think there needs to be better recruitment at the top. I'd like to see black, Asian and disabled commissioning editors across the broadcasters. That could happen tomorrow. I think it should start down below. I'd like to find ways of training working class people in community centres, try to do work in northern cities, find people with possibilities and have scholarships in place where they can progress. Paid placements are amazing. Expecting people to work for free all day long just to get into this industry is just not okay. There should be something else in place for black people, especially considering that the whole of the Ofcom board is white people. I think unless people are named and shamed, I can't see how this industry is going to change. If there's going to be a decision or a ruling on whether something is wrong that affects the black community, you need a black board. You need a board of black. If there's going to be something that affects the Asian community, you need a board that has Asian people. An open letter is written by that board. That gets shared by every member of the board, whether it's Stormzy, whether it's a John Boyega, whether it's a Idris Elba. Now you're creating a media storm every single time that we've been disrespected to a level. We have to make it less dog eat dog. Look at why a lot of us are leaving and try and find out how you can keep us here. There are a lot of announcements, a lot of schemes, a lot of this and that, but I think the work has to go into just doing it, you know, actually just recruiting people. It is an industry which is trying to accept the fact that the world is changing. I think it can change, it just, you need the right people to do it and it needs to be the people behind the scenes for sure. It always comes down to who's got the power and until that changes, it's not going to change. We need to stop sitting around in rooms and saying, someone should do something and we need to find the person who's going to do something. I don't know the way forward. I just know 
what I won't do is wait. You know, in 10, 20 years, we'll look back on, on this year and go, wow, you know, we've, we've achieved a lot since then. I hope this time in five years, 10 years, we don't have to be talking about the next scheme. We're just talking about the next amazing person. Have the vibe of tomorrow this could change and that's just how I'm rolling with it. Wow, I have watched that film quite a few times now and I'm, I never fail to be moved by it and uh, frustrated by it in equal measure. Um, I'm going to um, introduce our two speakers now. Uh, firstly, Beth Johnson, who was the executive producer and the instigator of that film. She worked with a production company in Leeds. She'll tell you all about that when, when she explains more about why she commissioned that film and uh, what some of the issues are to take from it. Um, Beth's an associate professor in film and media at the School of Media and Communication at the University of Leeds, um, one of the partners of uh, uh, SIGN. And um, she's also uh, you know, a published author and expert on issues to do with diversity in the screen industry. So, Welcome Beth and you know, thanks again for giving that powerful, moving personal testimony from people working in the industry. Our other speaker is Marcus Ryder. He is uh, you know, well-known in the industry and beyond, a well-known uh, leader on the issue of diversity in the media. He's recently taken up the position, I need to make sure I get this right, Marcus, of Head of External Consultancies at the Sir Lenny Henry um, Centre for Media Diversity. And they've done a lot of work um, with Sir Lenny and he in turn has done a lot of work to shine a light on the issues in the industry. I know also you, you're recently appointed Chair of RADA, so that's amazing. Um, and uh, Marcus is here today because he and Lenny Henry wrote a book, I think it was published in January, access all areas. Um, it's not just a book about the issues of diversity in the industry, it's powerful storytelling, personal accounts, and most importantly, a manifesto for change. So we have two brilliant people. Um, the structure will be that I'll turn to Beth first, and Beth, you'll, you'll talk about the film um, and the issues it's raised and reasons behind the research. Then to Marcus, who will do similarly. Um, and then, guys in the audience, we're really hoping that you're fired up to ask lots of questions, and please do that on the Q&A function. I'll turn to audience questions first when our two speakers have given us further insight. So over to you, Beth. Oh, thank, thank you very much, Kate, um, and um, uh, thanks to the York Festival Ideas um, for um, helping to support this panel. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here alongside Marcus and Kate, um, so thank you for that. Um, Industry Voices um, is a film series ultimately about people and the generous and um, very honest contributors that you've just seen are, are very much at the heart of its power. But it's also a film about structures and about power itself. As um, an academic, when I first had the kernel of the idea of what was to become Industry Voices, there were four things that I felt really strongly about. The first was that a film addressing inequalities in the UK screen industries should centre lived experience. The second was that the film series, as it was to become, should highlight intersectional barriers. And, and by that, I mean the sort of doubling and tripling up of barriers to opportunity of different identity characteristics. So, for example, being mixed race, working class and a woman. Thirdly, that the film should be made with the industry to really stand a chance of being heard and acted on by the industry. And fourthly, that the film was to be produced by a team with mixed levels of professional experience and a team that was diverse. Um, I think in addition to those sort of principles, it was also really important to think about region. Um, much of my work um, over the last 10 years is very much focused upon place. And in relation to the films, what I really wanted to do was give space for the contributors to reflect on region. 
and how that might figure as a barrier to inclusion and equality and opportunity. Um, the production company who worked with myself and uh, a brilliant ops lead, um, Wendy Sissons, and great researcher, Anna Ozimek, were Kanda. And Kanda are um, a Leeds um, independent production company who specialise in um, hard hitting um, social issue films. Um, they've got great experience working with the Joseph Browntree Foundation, for example. In developing the series, we focused on three industries, as, as hopefully you were able to see from those films. So we focused on film and television and also on the games industry. And our contributors were all industry professionals undertaking a range of roles at different career levels. Um, it was also important to us that half of the contributors um, to the Industry Voices films were from Yorkshire and the Humber. Um, and the remaining contributors um, were working in other regions so that, you know, um, we um, get a greater understanding of the ecosystem um, uh, of, of those particular industries. One question that I regularly get asked when we are lucky enough to be able to screen this film or the other films in the series is how did we recruit the contributors? And the short answer is with care. And by that, I don't mean that we selected contributors on the basis of what we wanted or hoped they might share with us, but rather that part of the professional practice that we employed was to recognise that so many in the industry, and indeed those who hadn't made it to the industry because of some of the barriers that we've just heard about, were already, bearing in mind this film was made last year in 2020, exhausted in and through living these experiences. So in the wake of the global pandemic, the murder of George Floyd, the Me Too movement, widespread accusations of bullying, it was really important to recognize that alongside those who really wanted to speak out, many could not and did not want to. So our contributors, um, amazing contributors, Sidemen, Fozia Khan, Lisa Holdsworth, Liana Stewart, Sean McAllister, Corey Brotherson, Sam Frey, Nick Ransom, Esther Yamea, Leah Magoya, and Sally Ogden all spoke for themselves, each having their own individual film. But I think it's in the extended cut, so the cut that we've screened today, that we can really better understand the structural barriers, okay, at work here. So in bringing those contributors' voices and experiences into dialogue, we can really begin to see the systemic ways in which our contributors are prevented from reaching their potential and understand how important and urgent change is. So I'm going to finish this little section with what one of our contributors said toward the close of the film, which is that that question of who has the power is absolutely central to making change. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. That was, a, that was brilliant. And it's given us some context for the film and your motivation for commissioning it. And uh, I certainly agree that, you know, the, the bravery, actually, um, as well as the, uh, you know, strength of the participants, you know, really came through. It really has shone a light, I hope, to the audience on what the issues are in the industry and also some of the... Um, you know, many initiatives that the industry has, uh, has, has developed and implemented over the coming years. But that point about power is a key one, isn't it? And I think that's very much, uh, if I can turn to you, Marcus, what you've picked up on um, in your book and your work previously as well. So can I hand over to you to talk us through the book and beyond? Sure, thank you so much, Kay. And I'm going to be really brief because the film was so amazing and it raised so many issues. And what Beth just said echoes what so many people in the industry think and echoes a lot of what I'm trying to get across that I don't want to be repetitive. So I'm just going to be nice and short. So we wrote, I wrote Access All Areas, the Diversity Manifesto for TV and Beyond with Lenny. Um, we started writing it in 2019. We finished writing, it was real quick to write, um, and it was published in 2020. So it took less than a, less than, no, 2021, sorry, this year, but it took less than a year. Um, so the main purpose of the book was to actually reframe the entire debate around diversity. Diversity is often seen as a minority issue, when in fact it is 
undoubtedly a majority issue. The working title for the book was actually Majority. Um, but we initially had pushback from the publishers who thought it wouldn't appeal to everyone and definitely framed it as a minority issue. And so very early on in the book, we wanted to point out the fact that white, heterosexual, non-disabled men make up just 29.5% of the population in, in the UK. So every time you see a white, heterosexual, non-disabled man on TV, you should see um, two women or a woman and a disabled person. They should be a minority. And yet they're definitely not a minority. And that's not just on TV. And that's just not in film. That's when you go into boardrooms. That's when you go into parliament. That's when you see judges. That's every single walk of life. White, heterosexual. And I keep saying it, but it needs to be repeated. White, heterosexual, non-disabled men are the minority. right? And yet our entire perceptions are that somehow they are the majority. And... I completely agree with Beth with regards to the importance of regionality and looking at areas outside of London. And so we spoke to the ONS, the Office of National Statistics. And when you look at white, heterosexual, non-disabled men living outside of London, they make up, drum roll, 3.1% of the population, right? So that means that it is definitely um, a majority issue. We make up 96.9% of the population. And that's not even going into class, right? And so once you actually put the layer of socioeconomic diversity on it, then you're talking about um, tiny, tiny numbers are somehow presented to us in throughout the media industry, but throughout walks of life as being the majority. It's, it's like a mind trick with, that has been played on us. Um, and so the whole point of the book or the, one of the central tenets of the book was to reframe the debate from being a minority issue to being a majority issue, right? And real quickly, as I said, I wanted to speed this up. So really quickly, why is this important? Because fundamentally, when it comes to the media, it's a question of democracy, right? You cannot have democracy without freedom of speech and freedom of speech basically is meaningless if certain sections of society are disproportionately denied access to the platforms for their voices to be heard and stories to be told. Now, people often think that when I say this, we're talking about news and current affairs and journalism, but it's an absolutely every single genre. There's a reason why during the 1960s with the McCarthy era, why they went after drama directors and drama writers, because it gives you a different perception. It gives you a different perspective on life. Drama does that even Reality TV does that. Every single type of genre, every single type of media gives you a different perspective, gives you different values. And if the values and perspective that you've got is only from a tiny minority, right, then that's going to impact your democracy, that's going to impact your society, the way your society is run. Right? And so the whole point of the book is to make sure that we think of um, diversity in the media as a majority issue, and we realize how if we do not get this right, we are hindering our democracy, we're hindering our freedom of speech, right? So I'm gonna be nice and short, I can witcher on for a lot longer, and I'm sure there'll be, I'm hoping there'll be some good questions that I'll be able to um, answer with Beth as well. Thank you. Well, I mean, that, that's such a huge, it's such a huge topic, Marcus, so thanks a million for trying to, uh, you know, condense that into, you know, such a powerful um, explanation of why this matters, why it matters so much to everyone. So thanks for that. And yeah, we'll definitely elaborate on that. Um, we have got some questions already. I do just want to ask personally, if I may take, um, you know, the privilege of being in the chair, kind of, uh, if I can just ask you each question, because I'm, I'm, Beth, you've explained beautifully why this research was necessary and why it was such a good addition to the lots and lots of research reports. All of those who've been in the industry and in the research field, we've seen those reports piling up. Um, but but this was very different and you've, ex you've explained why. Um, but I, I'd like to ask you if there's been any response um, to you as the exec producer uh, or to the participants um, and, and, you know, if you could if you can talk about that because of the nature of the research and their personal stories, 
Has there been any response from the industry? Thanks, Kate. Thanks so much. I mean, we've had we've had some brilliant responses, actually, which, which, which is incredibly heartening. Um, and some of our contributors have had um, responses as well. And, and um, if it's OK, I, I don't think it'd be right for me to talk about the individual um, uh, participants without their permission. But um, I can say that despite uh, it, particularly for our contributors, despite a lot of pre trepidation, um, the feedback that they received um, uh, from the industries within which they work and indeed personal feedback from families and friends has overwhelmingly been fantastic. Um, uh, one contributor, for example, talked to us about how proud her family was of her for speaking out and how this was a real legacy um, uh, for, for, for herself and, and indeed her daughter. Um, uh, Two of our contributors have had fairly significant job offers um, uh, following their engagement with the film. Um, and, you know, they they are very much under the impression that that actually, you know, wanting to speak out uh, and 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 being, you know, being part of that experience has been um, uh, important in that process and has given them a huge amount more confidence. Um, we've had some great feedback from, for example, um, Channel 4 in relation to this and I've had engagement from, from you know, further agencies, um, so the Social Mobility Commission, for, for example. Um, but yeah, I think it's also important to balance that a little bit and say, you know, um, we, we had some feedback as well, which pointed out um, not very much, but which pointed out things that we could have done better. And we take that really seriously as well. It, we didn't, you know, work on this film so that lots of people would say, oh, that's fantastic and carry on doing the same thing. Um, so it's very much, you know, going to be, I think, in the long run about um, deeds rather than words and about about that collective change. Um, so, yeah, I hope that's I hope that's helpful. Yeah, really helpful. Um, and I think um, uh, the other thing I want to say is lots of uh, good thought, the energy and ideas have come out from this film from a from a science point of view. You've mentioned, you know, some names there in terms of the, the brilliant team at Sign at the University of York. And, and uh, I know that this has really made us rethink. Um, and also, you know, we'll continue to take some of those stories and turn them into action. And I know you've also got plans personally, there for more research and other work. If you, um, I'll come back to that maybe, but just turning to Marcus before we open up to some of these questions coming in now. Um, you know, you mentioned in your book, and by the way, we've seen the film, and um, but you can't read the book unless you buy it, and here it is, and it's definitely worth buying. If you're a student, an industry professional, a lecturer, or a member of the general public, this is a good read, and it complements so beautifully the film that you've now seen. Um, and what it does is tell personal stories as well, um, and make and make these these you know rather powerful points. But I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, Marcus, because you and Selene have been doing, have been saying similar things, if not quite the same, for some time. There've been charters, there's been the Levy plan, there's been the Basque speeches, there's been a lot. So, so what hope do you hold that some of this is now going to stick? You know, that your manifesto might, your call to action uh, around majority. Do you are you hopeful that this will make a difference? And there's some some great questions coming up on, on this theme, but I just want to get your view on that. Um, I think what we need to recognise is that we are not going to achieve the change that we need through incremental um, advances. You know, so what I mean by that is that um, broadcasters. Every time you get a broadcaster on, they can point to a nice scheme that they've rolled out and the fact that there's a new commissioner who is disabled there, or there is a new senior executive who's on a board who is, who is black. And yet the, the figures, if you look at the actual number, especially when it comes to ethnic minorities of people in the population, um, uh, it hasn't actually, in real terms, it hasn't actually increased. So it just kept in line with, with the um, increase in general population, right? And so what needs to be done is there needs to be um, real structural change, 
you know, and the change in different types of policies. And so that's why um, Lenny and I and others have talked about ring fence funds, you know, in terms, so if you take regionality, you know, to actually increase the number of programs made outside of London, it wasn't a case of trying to invite a few people of Leeds to come into Channel 4 and say, hi, it's really nice to meet you. Okay, we actually like a few Northern people. That's great, right? They had to actually structurally invest in Leeds and change their entire process of working, you know? And similarly, if you want to increase diversity in disability, it won't be a, um, a case of simply putting in a few more ramps as if that's the reason why you don't have um, uh, you know, disabled people working at, at Channel 4, working at ITV or working at, at BBC. We need to look at the structural things in place and then we need to implement policies which actually address that. Yeah. Okay, and Phoebe um, has asked about this point. Regionality came up very strongly, obviously it was very much built into the research uh, parameters. Uh, and I, for one, haven't seen such a powerful um, exploration of that as in this film. But Phoebe says, in terms of regionality, we've seen a difference, have we seen a difference in diversity since the big broadcasters uh, have opened their northern offices and so on? Mark, as you've just been talking about, you know, some of the, the content quotas and so on. But are we seeing the impact of um, Channel 4's headquarters, sadly, you know, this is aligned quite a lot with with uh, COVID and the lockdown and difficulties there. But you know, do we do we think that's a, do we both think that's a, you know a huge platform for change for this region, the Yorks and other side? Do you want to take that, Beth, or should I take that first? Sorry, do you want to go first, Marcus? Okay, fine. So um, I worked um, in for BBC Scotland for for eight years. And so I was part of a big move that started in 2007 when the BBC moved out of, of London. Um, and so I would say, especially when it comes to the recent developments by Channel 4, it is far too, too early um, to say. The problem is making sure that we um, have editorial um, sign-off and final sign-off in the nations and regions, right? Because what invariably happens is that you do have commissioners. So let's say you have dispatches, right? You have current affairs dispatches. So you put a current affairs commissioner in, in Leeds and they feed into um, dispatches in London. And the vast majority is still made and decided by a commissioner and by an executive in London. And so what they're doing is that they're feeding into a narrative which is set by Londoners or people based in London. And so it, it's an advance but you're still fitting into a structure which is still fundamentally London-centric, right? Mm -hmm. And so, as I said, um, it's definitely better to do that, but we need to find ways in which we properly devolve power and we properly devolve editorial decision-making. So it's not just in a limited realm where you're feeding into a, an editorial decision process, which is already structured um, by Londoners. Yeah. Do you want to add anything, Beth? There's a few other questions, but I think this is such a good one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would just say I, I absolutely agree with Marcus in terms of Channel 4 coming to Leeds. It's so early, um, it, you know, it, it's very difficult to, to say at the moment. And obviously the pandemic has had, um, a, you know, a significant impact as well. Um, I very much, what I haven't seen, and I, and I wouldn't necessarily expect to be able to see at this stage, but one of the things that was very much discussed when Channel 4 came to Leeds was the importance of Bradford and that city. Um, and I haven't seen yet any evidence um, of um, that city really being considered in relation to this. I, I would want to and hope to see more. I recognize it's very early. Yeah. And, I, and, then, and, you know, again, from my position of privilege here in the chair, I'm going to say XR Stories and Sign have been really focusing on uh, specific initiatives for creatives um, in Bradford. And, you know, there's actually we, where we got that power and influence, can do more in terms of the work that we're doing through, through those programmes, and we are. Um, and it's very exciting to see that there might be a new screen industry strategy for Bradford specifically, 
coming through um, to, you know, just to emphasize that point, that well made point, Bess. Um, you both talked about the systemic issues in, in the industry. You both talked about power being, you know, a key factor here. But in terms of working practices, the systemic issue of working practices, fluidity, freelancing, uh, long hours culture, little pay at the beginning of your career, they're, they've been documented as being quite important issues for people trying to make their careers in the industry without um, without the kind of support from that network of family funding that you know other people enjoy. There's a question here from the Joint Christian Science Reading Group, presumably, uh, specifically picking up that point, but maybe more about women and motherhood um, and whether that's a, a barrier. It came through in some of those personal testimonies quite strongly. Uh, is there a discussion taking place that uh, would instigate a restructure of how the industry might accommodate parents? So, that's an interesting one, given that we've just spent a year in, uh, in, in lockdown with uh, parents, you know, having quite different dynamics and approaches to work. What, Beth, can I turn to you in terms of that? Is that something that you've, um, you've certainly picked it up in your film? Is it something that you see as a, a potential change? Um, I... It was absolutely picked up in the film. And as you say, there's so much research that, that in particular, um, you know, backs this up. Um, it's very, very entrenched. Um, you know, the fact is in, in, in an industry which is very much project based, which employs a huge amount of freelancers and in which there is, are, are, I think, very identifiable pressure points, particularly around, for example, children. Um, the support is, is not there. It's not in place structurally there is something wrong here. And it's not about helping the odd woman to be able to jump over that barrier. Again, it's about the structural change that's needed to ensure that that isn't a barrier, that that doesn't happen again and again and again. Um, uh, and um, the pandemic, you know, while it again, you know, the, the, the research that has been done around the pandemic um, it is quite early and I think we need, you know, a, a longer duration. The early research on on the effects of the pandemic have you know really really evidenced the way in which it's hugely exacerbated those already existing um you know barriers and pressure points um so that is incredibly worrying yeah and i think further work is going on here you know, so to mention john swords and the work he's doing um, uh, from the University of Southern Exile, we're looking specifically at some of these issues about working arrangements, patterns, parents, and, and working with some relevant industry partners. Rosie asks if, uh, if, if there's no one, uh, in, as it was said in the film, as you said, Marcus, if there's no one senior to look up to now, you know, um, is this just going to take too long to change? Um, I think both Beth and Marcus have said it doesn't have to. <laughs> we just have to be. We just have to, you know, recognise that this is about power. It's not just about initiatives at the bottom end of the training ladder. It's about changing, you know, the, the power structure. Um, so, Rosie, I hope it's not. It doesn't need to take years for this to happen. It just takes. It takes action. Um, and I think um, I think Mark has particularly talked to that point. Um, and, and Michelle, you talk about the broadcasters uh, rolling out lots of initiatives. How do we make them accountable for the freelance workforce that actually makes the shows? That's a, a good question. Is, do you want to pick that up, Marcus? Yeah, sure. It was really interesting. There was a point that in the film that Sideman made with regards to having a black panel and an Asian panel and what have you. And if you look at the BBC charter, the BBC Charter and Ofcom have different panels for the nations and regions. And the whole point of those panels is to, if there's something about Scotland or something, a policy which the BBC is doing which affects Scotland, um, that panel, the Scottish panel, is meant to pick up and advise on that. Similarly with Ofcom, um, for all the broadcasters, you know, Ofcom, which is the regulator, is meant to pick up on that, right? And while that was absolutely fine, that structure was, was fine when it was set, when the BBC was set up a hundred years ago. I think it's debatable whether this year is the anniversary or next year is the anniversary, depending on how you mark the BBC's um, uh, beginnings of the BBC. Right? 
there is currently no panel which represents um, ethnic minorities and represents those interests. There's no panel which represents um, women specifically in the needs of women. And so what, what we need is that if we recognize the need for regional panels and that Scottish, Welsh, Northern Irish people and English people are gonna have different, very specific needs, right? Then it, the logic should hold that other diverse groups and other communities should also make sure that their interests are not just in ad hoc, Lenny Henry gives a speech or Idris Elba says something or Riz Ahmed said something. There should be structures in place so that we can feed into um, the policy decision making as opposed to um, Beth doing some brilliant research and doing a film or me um, and the Lenny Henry Center doing another paper. You know, we need to make sure those structures are in place and they're not in place right now. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I'm keeping um, an eye on these fantastic questions coming through and I'm not going to give do you all justice. Um, Karen, the film is very powerful and thought provoking. How do you pro propose to use it to inspire future generations and promote change? Well, I hope today is already, you know, making a contribution to that. Um, uh, Joe, um, you've talked about other countries doing better at diversity in, in the film industry. That's a really interesting question. We're just about to do a piece of work to look at what other countries are doing internationally to, uh, you know, promote inclusive growth in the film and TV industries. It's an issue that you have heard about. I think I mentioned the BAFTAs and Oscars is the most visible uh, external, you know, platform for some of those debates. But you know, this this is something that lots of in uh, lots of countries um, uh, are are highlighting. Lots of countries are addressing. We want to know who's doing, you know, who's making a difference, and we'll learn from that. That's within the SINEXR regional context. But we'll work with the likes of BAFTA and so on to uh, do that research. Um, I wanted to, before we run completely out of time, acknowledge Karen's really important point about uh, one of the contexts where content is not a narrative driver, but it is actually, uh, you know, about ensuring content does talk and reach to everyone in society, not just the minority, as you put it, Marcus, um, but also the work that needs to be done at school level, hugely important point. Uh, but I want to go back to an anonymous attendee who said, um, what can we do? Is there anything we can do as individuals to help this? Are there areas of research? Can we support? Can we look for red flags when we look at crew lists and so on? What can the general public do to support this important theme of what happens off screen and why it matters to everyone? So Beth, to you first and then to Marcus for the last point. Points. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, Kate, and I, I wish I had a magic bullet. I think for me, one of the things um, that that you know that the public can really do is is become educated uh, about this. Um, uh, know more, recognize what sorts of, um, you know, also stand up for the sort of change that's really required. You know, um, you know, we we want to live in a in a in a creative, um, innovative interest in caring society and you know this affects everybody um so you know to to, to stand up and talk about it recognize its importance thank you beth and marcus um i think there's lots of things we can do again um you know quoting quoting sideman you know um people broadcasters do listen to complaints you're the reason why it's under no illusion that Channel 4 did not go out to the nations and regions. The BBC did not um, implement its nations and regions policy because it woke up one day and, and they, they woke up one day and thought, wow, let's, let's do this. This seems like the right thing to do. They did it because Ofcom told them to do it, right? And Ofcom told them to do it because DCMS told Ofcom that's what you had to do. Right. It might have been dressed up slightly differently than that, but really that's what happened. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you want, so you write to your politician, yeah. you know, write to your MP. We have, if, if we live in a democracy, we need to influence our MPs because our MPs primarily decide the policies, not the programs. And it's, I wouldn't want them to decide the programs, but they decide the policies and the framework of which the broadcasting industry works within. 
right? And as such, I think that's the most powerful tool that we have, and that's what we should be exercising. Fantastic. A fantastic way to end this session, which has just hopefully whetted the appetite and garnered the interest of lots of people in this issue. Um, Mobilise, be aware, understand, uh, you know, the importance of what you see on screen and, and the importance of uh, the workforce and the decision makers and the talent behind that. Get involved and stay involved and please follow the links that the fantastic team um, have been providing as we've been speaking. I just uh, need to thank so much um, the contribution from Beth and your amazing film and your research generally and Marcus uh, once again to plug your book and your ongoing um, commitment to work um, and actually your patience in staying with it to, to make this change and I want to really thank the organisers of the Festival of York for, for allowing us to have this platform today, um, the amazing team at Simon Excel Stories and obvi obviously the wider Department for Theatre, Film, Television and Interactive Media at the University of York. Thank you all for giving an hour of your time um, and please take the message on and forward. Um, sorry to interrupt. Can I just say a huge thank you to our brilliant contributors and to Kanda as well. They were phenomenal and I, I want to acknowledge them. Absolutely. Well, well made points again, Beth. Thank you so much. And finally, and again, Marcus and Beth, thank you. You've been brilliant as ever. Thank you so much, Kate. It was really, it was an absolute pleasure. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.